I'm going to open the Board of Selectmen meeting. Please note the location of this meeting has changed to the Council on Aging Function Hall. This meeting will be open to the public. However, per Governor Baker's COVID-19 order number 52, no more than 25 people may attend. If at any time the total number of attendees exceeds 25 people, the board will transition to a remote meeting and the public will be barred from attending the remainder of the meeting. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty. Again, one, uh, so Christine, if you want to take a seat, that's fine. One of the ground rules is we all have to wear the mask, although you can drop the mask if you need to speak. Okay, perfect. Thank you for joining us, Christine. Thank you for having me. Tell us a little bit about Mrs. Boykin. Yeah, so, um, so I was brought um, to my attention from um, Lauren and that they um, had an opening for the cultural council, and it interested me because I was recently involved in the playground we build, and um, I really want to do other volunteer uh, activities for the town. And this one sounded interesting for me because given the times, I wanted to help bring different cultural activities and learning for families and kids to the town. And how I was told, it was just really, really interesting to me. Uh, you did a wonderful job on the project for the playground. Okay. Enjoyed seeing your posts and yeah. seeing what was going on with it. Thank you for all the efforts that you have for volunteering for this position as well. Yeah. Does anyone have any questions for this team? No questions. Thank you for volunteering. Oh, thank you for volunteering. I think you're perfect for this. Thank you. I'll make a motion to appoint your team to the public council. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, Christine. Thank you. Thank you. Right of first refusal, Chapter 61 A plan, United Drive, assessment map 35, lot 
0.002 and West Street assesses map 42, lot 001. So there are two parcels currently in 61A land, which means that they are um, at a reduced tax status because there are no agricultural purposes. Um, the owner is looking to take them out of 61A land, and he or she or they are proposing to add a 204,000 square foot warehouse on that piece of property. So it remained as industrial, which is where it belongs, it's at the industrial park. Um, so the three boards that are required to review the Conservation Commission Planning Board and the um, Board of Assessors have all reviewed it. Um, there is no interest in it. The parcels are selling for $500,000. If the town wants to purchase it, we can call a town meeting and we have subject to first letter refusal, which means that we can purchase it for $500,000. In reviewing the property, there really isn't a lot of value to us, especially where it's an industrial area. Uh, I think it would you know, allow them to continue to develop it as an industrial parcel. Is there a motion? I'll make a motion to wait for the first discussion. Second. Any discussion? No, that's uh, So we placed this on the agenda after the discussion of the Board of Selectmen's meeting last week. Um, I was, quite frankly, not as prepared for the discussion um, because I didn't anticipate it. Uh, however, we have read the Mass DOT rules and regulations. I believe that the board, along with myself, would like to be able to see what we can do to minimize um, commercial traffic there. Because it would also have a positive impact on the lack of commercial traffic on some of the adjacent roads, such as South Elm, Lincoln Street, for example. Um, so I've placed the motion that would be required before the board to be able to take that motion. We would begin the process as we did on River Street, which is we are already armed with the engineering um, information from OCPC. We would forward it off to Mass DOT. Mass DOT then would render a decision. Last time it took about nine months, so I would assume the same. There is one caveat to this one though, is that it's in the highlight area before you. Uh, is that we have to disclose to Mass DOT a legitimate off, um, uh, additional opportunity for those trucks to drive down versus our roads. So it's easy on River Street, because in River Street, they were supposed to be on 106. I mean, they should never have been on River Street to begin with. Um, these vehicles here are actually coming from the industrial area in Bridgewater. And that's why OCPCs recommendation was they have highly unlikely that mass DOT will approve it. But we're going to give it a shot, right? So what we did, and I need to make sure that the board approves this, is that I have put placed before you a Google Maps and where the red line starts on Scotland Street is where the east or where the West Bridgewater Bridgewater line starts right there at the bridge or right past the bridge. And that there, thank you Lana, is the beginning of Bridgewater's commercial area. So what we would be petitioning Mass DOT to do is to require all of that traffic to travel down Elm Street, down to 104, back on to 24, back north to wherever it is that they would be going. So unless you believe otherwise, this would be the alternative route that we would be willing to um, support to Mass DOT. Because it happens to be entirely in the town of Bridgewater, we must receive Bridgewater's written approval first for the process does. So if you would like to move forward with attempting to put the exclusion on Scotland Street, I would ask you to take the vote to do so, which is in the packet. And then at that point, I will then forward a memo on behalf of the town and the board to Bridgewater, ask them to take an approval vote. And assuming we get it, we would send off to Mass DOT. If Bridgewater does not provide an approval letter, there's nothing else we can do with that one. How long do they have to get back to you? They do this. There is no time frame uh, in the rules and regulations on Mass DOT. But I know the town manager, I'll get a decision. Uh, it's the holidays, so they have a town council, they don't have town meeting. 
Um, so my guess is, and I'm guessing I'm not talking to him, but I know him very well, um, is that my guess is we, we probably receive an answer by, by the end of January. That's my guess. Denise, can I ask a question? Yes, please. Unless uh, Anthony has something to say, I don't know. <clears throat> Dave, so on that red line, that bridge, that's <clears throat> that shows. So that red line goes all through Bridgewater, back around and up. Am I following that right? Because I know Scotland Street, where right. you we're talking, right? Yeah. All the traffic over there. So if you come off of 104, you take a left. I think that's Scotland. And then the cars go, and they keep going straight. Now, if they come down there and they hit the bridge, right? Am I, follow, am I yeah. saying it right? So the traffic, how would they turn around to go stay on? Or they won't be able to go down there? There wouldn't be, well, they could go down. So from 104, do you see 104? I, it, um, oh, right there. there it is, all right, yeah. yeah. So from 104, and if Thank you were you. to travel towards West Bridgewater, that's actually Elm Street in Bridgewater. All right, yeah. All right? And that's there about where the line is that enters into West Bridgewater. Right. So we would have a sign right there that would say, Heavy vehicle trucks excluded from Scotland Street. So, so they would have to turn around. Now, quite frankly, most of that, well, that road there is all zoned industrial in Bridgewater. Yep. So 95% of the traffic going into Scotland Street that's commercial is coming out of those commercial facilities and then taking a left to go into West Bridgewater. And so what we would be doing is we would be asking to require that they take a right to go down 104 and then go up 24 parallel to Scotland, heading north. Now, is there a bridge right there? You said, is there that little bridge? There right? is. That, shouldn't that be on the road? Is that our bridge or is that Bridgewater's? Uh, I believe that that is ours. I'm just going to say, I know before, Tuck, the ex cop, he used to do all the weight trucks around here. Yeah. I don't know if people remember, <clears throat> but if they're going over that bridge, what's the weight limit on that bridge itself? So we reached out to Mass DOT, and there, what we have been told is that because there is no posting from DOT, that it doesn't qualify for a weight limit. And the reason being is because it doesn't have enough span. So again, we're waiting for something from Mass DOT in writing, but if they, can, they, they have different definitions for their bridges. This does not classify as a technical bridge because it doesn't have enough span, and therefore it doesn't have a posted weight limit. Because we don't post the weight limits, DOT does. So absent that posting, we are told that they have never actually determined a weight because there's no weight limit to place on. Automatically protested and all that, but you, Denise, am I in order? 
Drug testing in the town, so we, we do. And how does that work? Can you just go up to somebody and say, "You, you have to go be drug tested." Uh, well, so the answer is technically, I guess, yes, because we're the one to go up to that person. But this company here does a random drawing, if you will, and then they contact the HR director first thing in the morning, and then she will notify the DPW director, and she will say these three have to be born at 11 o'clock today. And what kind of drug test is it? Just a yard. And how much does that cost the town to be part of that? It's on the contract. I can't see that, Denise. I, I can't. Um, well, actually, um, it is per test, so there's no aggregate amount on there, so it's a matter of how many tests we do. So uh, I don't recall what we did this past year. I'm going to say, and again, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to be exact on this, but it would have been somewhere around $2,024. So do we have a motion to approve the contract? So moved. Second. I thought about this, Mary. I mean, the we in reviewing your conflict of interest letter, um, this does not pertain to a contractual arrangement with your husband. There is no financial inducement for you or your husband. Um, but if you want to recuse yourself, just out of additional. Uh, Caution and one of all. No, I just wanted to make sure there wasn't a legal standpoint that you were aware of. Um, no, I feel comfortable. Um, this doesn't impact us personally, uh, financially, in any way. It doesn't impact me in any way. Um, so, you have so to go a second. second. Yeah, second. Any further discussion or questions regarding this contract? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Award fire capture exhaust system to air cleaning specialists of New England. So this is great news. Um, we went out to bid and received a federal grant of up to $67,000 to make sure that we would capture all of the diesel exhausts because they've uh, proven to lead to cancer. Um, we went out to bid back in the early part of the year. We awarded a bid at that point of $61,000 to air cleaning specialists. The person that they beat in the bid did a bid protest, and after the Attorney General's office reviewed it, they asked us to do another bid. Um, so we went out, we did another bid, the same two companies bid, the same company won. Um, however, it's actually $9,000 cheaper, the second going around. Um, now it's not our money, it's the federal money, but whatever we can save taxpayer money at any level, I think that's positive. Um, and uh, hopefully there'll be no bid protest this time. We were a little bit extra careful with our due diligence in going up to bid, and quite frankly, these are the only two players in the state, for the most part, that compete. They're pretty aggressive towards each other, and litigation is commonplace whenever one loses the bid to the other. But we followed all the AG rules and regulations on this to the T. We touched base with them during the bidding process. So we feel confident that we would survive any potential bid protest. And as a result, it is before you. I believe it's in the amount of $52,527. And I would ask the town and ask the board to award it as, as um, presented. Fair question. Can I ask a, a question? Sure. Um, you said the bid came back at $9,000 less. Was there any change in animal services to be provided? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So again, I think this is another nice positive. Uh, I want to say thank you to the HR director of the Detroit. She did an excellent job on this. Uh, this year is going to allow both the highway fleet building along with the town hall to actually have keyless entry. Instead of people having a traditional key, they would actually have a little wand. Uh, they will be able to lock and unlock not only the exterior doors, but also the doors to their offices. Um, and the purpose of this is, is that many times we, we may lose a key, 
We don't know exactly who has access to the building. Um, there were some people that were concerned under COVID that you're putting a key into a door, you pull it out, there's COVID on the key, and you're transferring it to somebody else. So as a result, under the Federal CARES Act, which is expenses related to COVID-related expenses, um, they are approving this request. So it gives us the opportunity to be able to modernize both buildings. And now at the computer screen, we are going to be able to make sure that we can turn on or turn off authorization. So for example, an employee retires, they leave, we want to make sure they don't have access to the building, um, you can make sure that they don't have access to the building. Scott Goldie is extremely young, so he won't be retiring anytime soon. But imagine if you had somebody that had access to checks or bills or money. So we can, you know, we can, we can tighten this up a little bit. Um, our highway department has a substantial investment into tools and, and trucks and other apparatus. So again, it allows us to make sure that nobody accesses that building that shouldn't access it. So with that said, um, the total bid, this is off the state bid list, However, instead of just taking the lows, the taking one, um, Linda did a nice job. She reached out to five different state bid list companies. She walked through the entire facilities with them, and she solicited quotes from all of them. The cheapest one came at $79,823. I'm going to ask you to award it for a total of $84,000, because you always want to build it a little contingency because there's a problem with the door. Um, or, or whatever the case might be. And uh, once we hopefully go to award this tonight, immediately tomorrow they're going to order the parts. We have to spend this money by the end of the year. And so we're hoping by the end of the year that we'll have a, a, a modern keyless entry system for both buildings. And David, this will be 100% reimbursed through the CARES Act. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So I think we're going to incur additional expenses come the spring. And these other municipalities have no financial flexibility built in. So that's why I want to make sure I have at least a couple of hundred thousand dollars left over. So the positive is, is that the Plymouth the County Office, which again, you'll speak to tomorrow night, is that um, Tom O'Brien has reached out to our state delegation saying, we really need to be able to extend these funds. And of course, they're in favor of it. But the Senate is the one that has not extended it. And there's different reasons for that from a political standpoint. So with that said, if it gets extended, we're going to be in a really good position because we're going to have additional funds to be able to You're kind of caught at this point. Do we just spend it to spend it, or do we want to save some in case because we will have legitimate expenses come next year? And I'm going to give you one example. When we went to town meeting this past year, we got the TVs. We had to do a whole bunch of other things from a sanitation standpoint. Cost is about five thousand dollars. So, so if, if they don't spend that, that, extend that, that money, but we still have COVID next year, we got to do the same thing. We got to spend it five grand. So I would much rather have this money still available at that point. I just don't know if it will. So what's the deadline that we have to spend this money by? December 30th. And you probably need it tomorrow? Tomorrow night. And we still have a couple of meetings left for the year. So there would be no harm in waiting until the next meeting to find out what other towns are doing. Just to, that would make me feel more comfortable. If I knew what other towns were doing, um, COVID is not going away January 1st, just like you said, and if there's other and better use for the money. One of the things we, we tossed around a little bit at an earlier meeting was, and, and Dave, you can explain this, you explained it very well that night, was, was there a way of utilizing these funds to help directly to the residents? Yeah, I said, that's not allowed. No, it's not allowed. It's right. not allowed. So it, it's based on spending for whatever we may need, inventory, or whatever the town may need. And like Dave did explain, there was a deadline on, of January 1st. So you know, we're at the risk of leaving the money on the table unspent, and I'll say spend it. So the point is, to, to, to Mary's concern, is that we had this conversation that night, and that's why we went forward to get all these bids. Um, if we do not authorize it tonight, we are not going to get there. Because there's lead time to order parts to install, and the checks must be cut and must be expended by December 30th. So if we wait until December 2nd, which is our next meeting, we will never make it December 30th for them to order the parts, have everything come in, install, and pay. And that's true for many other things. Oh, yeah. So I thought just the checks had to be cut. Can't go check until the parts done there. Right. Or your research job. They won't ship it without it. I didn't know if it was one of those things that they installed. No, I'm just saying, I mean, I haven't looked at the parts right now. This is $80,000. Let's assume parts is $40,000. I'm not going to want $40,000 worth of stock unless I have somebody, some guarantee that there's a fair amount of money that somebody's going to buy it from me. They're not going to do this. And you know, under Mass General Law, we can't pay for anything until the service is provided and done. So all of the work will get done, and then we'll pay them. But by agreeing to this, we sign a notice to the ward. They then have the authorization to be able to go all the water parts. They know that they have the money. So, but if we don't spend this, then we would have three hundred thousand dollars. If we do spend it, we have two hundred thousand dollars, and we still run the risk that we're not going to be able to spend all of it. But if we want this. Unless somehow we know it's going to get extended, that decision has to be made now. We wouldn't have to do that now. Which buildings is this? So I know you said the town hall and the So it's 84000 just for those two? Right. Well, it's every office. Yeah. Right. It's not just every, every office within the town hall will have appeals that they've done. Is that a testimony? Are all of those offices locked right now? <laughs> Are keys given up to everybody? Well, everyone doesn't have a key to everyone. So that's exactly what this would be. So that way, for example, the assessors are here. 
Mr. Donahue would have a key fob to enter the building. He and enter his field um, office. So we might enter, say, the selectman's office. Um, the accounting office can get into their building office, but they're not going to be able to get into the assessor's office. So their keys are like that now. But I can tell you there are keys out there that shouldn't be. I can't tell you who or where. You know, it's just that's the way it happens with keys, especially when you have, you know, a couple hundred employees that come and go all the time. So. So I can tell you that most of the time is spent to their limit, and we our number is lower. I can't tell you as to whether or not they all do the do the view. Um I don't want to say the wrong thing. My guess is is that some people have done this because when we called, they were already aware of it. But most people have just started to upgrade their technology, such as online permanent, for example. Um, I can't tell you for sure how many people have done it. But I think we identified this as a need. If there was a need individual in particular, we talked about that and that just selected the meeting. And we went forward. I guess I'm surprised that it was me, that it was uh, Can, you, can I just? Sure. Uh, Dave, you said that's federal money. So Stevie Lynch, uh, uh, state senator, U.S. senator, is going to uh, give you more input if you reach out to him. So we have. And if for the extension, if it's going to be extended, if we don't spend the money, what you just said by December 31st of 2020, we lose the money. Yeah. And it has to be spent before 2020, or you can have something on the table. It just is not ready to go, but it'll be ready to go, say, like in January 2021 or February 2021. The way the legislation was written must be expended by December 30th. That is not the way legislation is normally spelled out. But in this particular case, again, this was part of that $4 trillion package that was passed back in the spring, and we got employment checks and all this was part of that money. Um, but it is written right now with December 30th. I will tell you, Stephen Lynch's office, Mr. Keating's office, all of those offices that the County have been in touch with, they were all in favor of extending it. The House has already voted to extend it back in May. The Senate has not taken it up. And again, it's that federal law. But we're allocated the money you just said. We already have that money. We already have it. They extend it. They're not going to give us more money. They're just going to extend the deadlines for if you want to do more. Are they going to give us more? No. So we have until December 20th, on December 30th, to spend a little over $1 million. So just in case it don't get extended, why don't we have everything on the thing in case you say it has to be spent? I, th I think that's what I'm losing. It has to be already spent before December 31st, or just say, they're not going to extend it. You know that for sure. They say, all right, so December 28th, hey, we can put the rest of the money towards this or that. Without an extension at the federal level, all monies must be extend, expended by December 30th. So the, the balancing act was, let's spend what we can, but not spend every single dollar, because everybody always assumed that it was going to get extended, and it just never did. Politics got in the way. It never happened. Now, during a lame duck session, maybe, but as we know, there's some hard feelings in Washington right now. Everybody has to sign on. Whether or not it gets extended, we don't know. The, Demo uh, the Massachusetts delegation is already communicated to both Governor Baker, because he does it for the rest of the state, Plymouth County does it for Plymouth County towns, They've already informed all of us that they're in favor of extending it and they've already voted as such. It is tied up in the Senate. So I'm sure Elizabeth Warren and Mr. Markey are both in favor of extending it, but they're not the controlling party at this point. I'm just saying, I know it's not my meme, but I'm just saying, if we're going to lose it, we should try to use it. If we're going to play a gamble game to say, well, we'll just wait. If they don't extend it, we're up 200000 or whatever's left over. That's all. It's nice to know we get money from the federal government. That's the process, Dan. This is a matter of us spending it and then getting reimbursed from the county? Yes. So we spend it and then we get reimbursed. Okay. 
And so on a big ticket item like this, we don't spend it until we receive authorization from them. I would never commit to $80,000 without knowing. If I had committed to $200 worth of plexiglass, we roll the dice. But you know plexiglass is easy. But that's why I said we called on this. And when we called, he said yes because he had already been advised that other municipalities were doing it. But I don't want to say the wrong thing and say it was 80 or 3. I honestly just don't know that number. So that's why we looked at it and we said, okay, we've got to spend the money like Neil was saying. We've got to spend the money. He has an opportunity that I think we were all on board at the time about. So we said, let's go ahead and do this. We still have at least $200,000. It might even be a little bit more. But we still have at least $200,000 that we haven't spent. But the gamble, the gamble at that point was, if we just spend that additional money, do we still need it come spring? You're saying don't even spend this in case we need it come spring. But then as Neil says, if it doesn't get extended, it's not $80,000 of loss. And again, there's no easy answers right now. Nobody, you know, nobody has, a, has a real answer. It is, and it's just and it's 708 just to let you know what I'm saying. Um, okay, so I think we had a vote. Yeah. I think we had a second one last. Yeah, I think I did a second one. Okay. We voted for favor. Aye. Aye. Okay. That's unanimous. Thank you. Okay, so just 708. So why don't we. What I would do is uh, I, would, I would vote to open the hearing. Um, and then I would ask them if it's okay with you because we have our next meeting at 7.30. Maybe we could go back to this agenda. I think we can wipe it out in about five minutes, and then we can, and if not even less, and then we can fulfill our hearing. Town of West Bridgewater public hearing property classification policy. Pursuant to the provisions of Chapter 40, Section 56, NGL, notice is hereby given that the Board of Selectmen will hold a public hearing on Wednesday, November 18, 2020, at 7 o'clock p.m. in the Selectmen's meeting room, Town Hall, 65 North Main Street, West Bridgewater, Mass., to consider the issue of adopting the residential factor and tax levy percentages. Specifically, the issue of adopting local property tax levy among the five property classes, residential, open space, commercial, industrial, and personal property, for fiscal year 2021. <coughs> Interested parties are invited to be present to be heard. Board of Selectmen, Denise R. A. S. Chairman. This is published in the West Bridgewater News on Thursday, October 29, 2020. So at this point, we would suspend our meeting and open the classification hearing. Is there a vote to motion? Second. Second. All those in favor? All right, so do you want to do this here now, or do you want to ask them if they'll wait just a couple minutes? We'll go through this fast, and then we will go back to the stage. Would you mind? Or Not at all. Nope. Okay. Not at all. All right, thank you. Appreciate My pleasure. That. Okay. Um, act on Borough Boys Foundation request to sell Christmas trees and wreaths November 28th through December 22nd. Welcome to approve the wave, please. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Take it away the map of Massachusetts. We all enjoyed going on. You can see what was red and what was green and what was yellow. They know how to do that. So they just tell us as to whether or not we're a high risk community or not. And as long as we stay below 25, as long as you can stay at that, would be great, please. Um, as long as we stay below 25, we're a low risk community. 
the only town or city that is adjacent or contiguous to us that is high risk at this point is Rockton, which they've been for some time. Instead, of, they got away from the map of Massachusetts. They now put a map of the of America. So I just put this in here, um, and that way you guys could all see where Massachusetts as a state ranks in comparison to the rest of the country. Uh, the lighter you are, the less risks per hundred. The darker you are, the more cases per hundred. And that's updated apparently every Wednesday. Um, we are doing an in-person board meeting today. And the reason we are for a couple of um, issues. One is, is that we're doing a tax hearing. Sometimes people come up for that. We thought that it was important as a board to make sure that we could have interaction with members of the public. Um, and the second thing is we are going to have an executive session that includes a grievance from, from the fire department. And we, it's going to be too difficult to be able to do that through Zoom. So as a result, we're doing this. Um, the meetings still have to be less than 25 people. I was going to actually entertain the conversation with the board last time we talked about maybe doing this in the future. However, I do think it sends the wrong message that if we were to start doing in-person meetings, when numbers are going up here in Massachusetts, uh, and, we, um, and we're going into the colder months, I think that we should still stay with remote. But again, if you guys feel otherwise, please let me know. Um, and obviously, I'll take the cue from you. Um, Anything you want to say in that sport? So uh, while my preference is in person, the, the issue we have is we cannot project how many people may or may not have come to our meeting. And we have a number of people come that we can't accommodate with the COVID-19 rules in place. Then we have to suspend the meeting. Um, we can still use COVID-19. We could do that, but yeah, I'm really in the middle of this one. So if you do remote, excuse me, remote means you're at home and you can call in, or how's that work? Well, remote, the way we're doing it means that we could either be remote or in the conference room together and still, if that's considered a remote meeting, it wouldn't be open to the public though. Why can't we just go to the uh, high school gymnasium? What that would involve is the fact that we don't know how many people are going to show up and after we're done, it will have to be sanitized. There's still 25. That's quite you know, a expense. No matter the size of the venue. Oh, even with the yes. venue of that side, it's still oh, going to be just 25. Andrew's right. We could be at Gillette Stadium. Oh, okay. Okay. Can you just hold 25 right here? But regardless, when you're done, it's going to need to be sterilized. Well, there's a vote. I agree with the Anthony. Couldn't you do a combination of both? I do Yeah, okay, perfect. Uh, perfect. Uh, you two, if you want to meet in, in person, uh, hold the meeting Aaron. in the selectmen's room. And Mary could then join in remotely. Yeah, however, I will tell you this. If we're going to do in-person meetings like that, we can't do them in the select meeting room. Um, because all it take is one or two more people in the select meeting room, and you're going to be at capacity based on social distancing. So we would only be doing it here, or we would always be doing it in the school. We'd have to be doing it somewhere else. Um, there's some cost involved because, like, for example, last night, the fire department came here, they sanitized this room, so that way everybody here would be safe because it's not being used by the council agent. After everybody vacates, they, they will be back and they'll sanitize it again. We have a machine with pods, it's kind of like a mister. It's not terribly expensive, but every time you do it, it costs another 50 to 75 dollars plus their time. Um, so there's not a lot of cost involved, but there's some. But it does require that we would, we would not be able to do it at the selectmen's room because of its size. We would most likely be here or a different venue if we were to go there. Have you had any questions asking when the, the meeting was resolved? Well, both in two of the public and that they're they wanting to attend? I've had one, and it was Neil. Uh, um, at the town meeting in June, he came to me, you know, nicely, but he just said, when do you think we'll resume the meetings? And, you know, I told him the truth. I didn't see it any time in, in the near future. And he understood, but he is the only member of the public 
that has, has said something to me. But quite frankly, it applies to what I make. I only see that you back to the work. Well, you know, at this point, with the numbers rising, and we can see how much of a problem of the why don't we continue to work for now? However, the meeting is being recorded, no, I'd like to come after my meetings. close to 25, 20 to 25 people total here, so this works. There's some challenges that we, we spent the day the year setting up, cable had to come here, they have to set up, you know, we had some cabling issues early, we gotta work through those. Um, I suppose after you do it after a period of time, it gets a little bit quicker, easier, better. Um, but you would definitely not be doing it at the select meeting, you'll be doing it on the When do we start budget discussions? February, yeah, yeah. 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 We have anything uh, significant that we know of coming up over the next couple months until February? The only significant, if you will, is that your next meeting is that you will be interviewing three police officers for asylum. We have done, we, I expected that we would have been doing that through Zoom, which we could still do, uh, but I expected we would have been doing that through Zoom. So we're running short on time with this too. Do you want to pen this for now and have further discussions at our next meeting about it and then if necessary we'll take a vote? Okay. That's not fair. All right, in the last two items, um, military quality toy drive, kudos to one of our West Bridgewater residents. Um, her name is Elise Pico. I hope I got that right. If not, I apologize. She's a high school team. Okay, I didn't get it right. Um, but, uh, but kudos to her. She is the Northeast rep uh, for the U.S. Guard Team Association. And so November is Military Family Month and similar to like a Toys for Tots. She is looking to do a toy drive for military families. A box is at the high school at the uh, town hall right now. It is also at all the schools and the library. So if you would like to donate some toys, Please drop them off, and on December 2nd, uh, Lee will be picking them up. And the last is, is that I met with the mayor of Brockton last week with a handful of other municipalities as well. We all know Brockton is struggling uh, with COVID cases. It's hard. They've got a dense population. We know density matters with this. And so he's looking to see if whether or not it can be a regional approach. Quite frankly, West Bridgewater has done pretty good with it. Um, and we don't have a lot of resources, so it's not we can share a lot with, with Brockton. However, I think that whenever we can work in a collaborative way, it's good, so we'll continue to meet with them, and wherever we can share best practices, we will. Okay, at this point, then, I think we are prepared to resume the public hearing on property classification policy. Steve? Yep, you're all set? All set, thank okay. you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, the board's uh, here before you tonight for the uh, this will be a 2021 tax classification hearing. Uh, and you have the packet in front of you, I hope. Um, the first page, we'll go through it, and you have, you know, as you have any questions, please you know, feel free. First page, the cover page. Uh, the second page, the classification hearing, uh, the purpose of the hearing, it's pretty standard, to adopt the town's tax, taxation policy by allocating or classifying the tax levy among the five property classes. The Board of Selectmen must vote on how to adopt the tax rate policy either by a single unified rate or by a multiple split tax rate. And um, that last piece there, and I mention this every year, that, that, that last little uh, thing about the, the single or the, or the multiple split tax rate, 
leads into the next page on the pie chart. Um, I allude to this every year that, you know, you look at that and it's really important uh, to make note of this, that the, uh, here in our little community of West Bridgewater, um, based on a number of things I could go over or not, but we have a pretty viable community. But what lets me know that is that, uh, like I said, I do this for a living, you know, outside of this job here, and uh, most of the towns around here don't have that commercial industrial base to offer a split rate. Most of them have to go to the single rate and don't have a choice in that. Here, yeah, because of a good, you know, really, uh, like the pie chart, indi pie chart indicates, a commercial industrial, uh, at least those two, they offer up over 28% of, of, of the base of our value. The Department of Revenue says, uh, for a standard, your community should be about 22, 23% to offer up a classification chance or, you know, to do that. Most of these towns around here don't have that, uh, aren't afforded that, so they have to go to the single rate. Here, because of our community, the, the infrastructure, the industrial park, highway access, and uh, a host of other stuff, we have a good commercial base to allow to say, part of the um, residential burden is gonna be put onto the commercial people. So that's why we can do that, because of the, what the pie chart says here, okay? Um, the, next, the next page, um, it's the, what it is, it's a, it's a value uh, for each of the last six years by class. Um, class one residential for uh, FY21 is, as you see, the top right, 886,926,100, and so on. It goes to the class three commercial, and um, you know, each, each uh, column, cl uh, class four industrial, then the subtotal of the, of the commercial industrial, then the personal property, then the, the commercial industrial personal property subtotal, and then the total value, which you know, I like to allude to that, I made the, uh, uh, the statement a couple years ago, you know, this ain't where I worked before, the city of Newton, it's up to about 14, 15 billion, but in FY16, we surpassed the billion dollar mark, which I think is remarkable for our community and the number of taxable passes. I'll let you know that we hit, again, adding all, things, adding all these uh, things up, we have a pretty viable community here. Um, below that is the, uh, is, is the bar graph, just to let you know how the values my classes have increased over those, those same years as above. And you can see that the, uh, the residential properties, according to the bar graph, have taken off pretty good. Again, as they should in a community like this. And part of that's judged by when, you know, down the road or in the past when the, the, the market's gone into a little bit of recession, you know, your Brockton's and Fall Rivers and Lowell's tend to pretty much go off the table. Your West Bridgewater's and Easton's and Bridgewater's, they stay, they might go down a little bit, but they stay pretty flat. And that, again, that's a, uh, you know, as I mentioned to the, uh, what our community is all about. Um, the next page, you have the, um, the three color charts. The, the top, uh, the top uh, row the, is residential in, in the blue. The middle is the commercial. And the yellow is the industrial. If you go over to the, on the, blue, on the top blue one, under the residential um, parcels, over the far right, that column for FY21, um, on the values just for the single families only. Um, we, John, we just want to isolate that to see how that you know, works in as, as compared to the others. Just, uh, in uh, West Bridgewater, FY21, uh, we have 2114 single family homes and um, the value is 760,906,300. And then what it shows right on, on, the far right, on, the, on the far right column, um, it just shows a percent change of the value, the parcel count, the rate 1640, because you haven't set the rate yet, um, we, John and I estimated that rate on the board, but we estimated that rate just at, at 1.4 at 1640, um, with the average bill of, on the, on the bottom blue line in, in West Bridgewater, Fair Fly 21, the average bill is 359,937, um, times the rate at 1640, gives you the, the average tax bill of that. So what it does at each, in each row here, blue, uh, pink, and yellow, it just goes through the total value and what each class will do at that split uh, times that estimated rate. Um, and we'll, we'll get into that in a few minutes in uh, more detail. So those three, again, those three rows just kind of break down the singles, the commercial industrials, and the, um, you know, the total for each. And you can see from 16, 
through 21, there's been significant changes in the town of West Bridgewater for the valuations. Um, the next page is, there's a lot thrown at you there, and I will, um, you'll, you'll base your, how you want to go with the split and such, uh, take a look at these columns. The, the blue column on the left is the residential um, properties, the middle is, as labeled as the commercial, and the, and, the, and the far right is in the, in the yellow is the industrial. Um, at the top, the average value for FY21 residential is 359,937. The commercial is 180 and the industrial is 1,440,363. .360, then, if you go down to the bottom of the page on, on, on the left, like for example, the residential portion, it shows last year's um, the average bill uh, at that at the um, previous uh, at the average at the average tax bill last year, and then you can compare to, for example. With the average value this year in FY21 of 359,937, if you select that rate of you know, 1.4, the rate would be 1640. The bill, if you read with me at 1.4, the bill would be 590297. And it gives you the percent change from the bill from FY20, um, dollar change, um, 54 bucks, and the, uh, and the percent change in that. So those percent changes kind of fall along with the bill amount, the tax rate. And the changes in notes. It, and then you pay attention when you select those rates um, for the residential. Then you go over to the at the one four um, on, on the commercial at the average at the, the, the middle column. I'm sorry. At the the average value of a million oh one eight one eighty at the one four. The tax bill would be um, at the one four would be twenty eight thousand seven five three. The increase would be a uh, hundred thousand. And we read uh, $1,251.54. Going over further right to the industrial, uh, at the, the average value of $1,440,363. Um, the, at the 1.4 split, you would see the tax dollars go to $40,675.85, and the tax rate is um, the, the, the tax rate is the, 20, the same as commercial 28.24, and it shows a percent change from FY20 the dollar change and the and the dollar percent change. So in these three columns, there's a lot thrown at you there, but essentially it says when you select the rate that you're going to select tonight, that what the implications are going to be on the average bill for each class. And then, you know, we'll, we'll go on if you have any questions. Um, Steve, Steve, can I ask a question? Sure. If I'm looking at the commercial uh, three columns, the Property at the 1.4 split. Yep. It shows in the center column um, 2824, which that's a decrease from 2020. It must. Um, what was the um, the, the 2846 rate? last year? Yeah. It, 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 right. It's just not uh, right. It was, it's a it's a it's a difference in the rate. Okay. Okay. Um. Yeah, I apologize, not going right off, but I guess it's lost a flag to look at too, so. <laughs> um, it's at the bottom. Too. Yeah, okay, yeah, I got, yeah, I saw that, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. yeah, no problem. So, um, you have those, you know, again, those three columns are gonna show uh, the implications of the of the rate, that these, the, the split rate that you select tonight for the residential versus the uh, commercial industrial. Um, and then the next, um, the next page is in white, the next few pages, just give you uh, a, an example that if, if you choose a, a certain rate, it just kind of points out last year's value versus this year's value and the implication on the rates. The, um, it goes residential, and then page nine, as I have here, uh, it goes for the commercial. And then uh, page 10, page 11 is the industrial. So what those sheets do, it just gives you a chance to look at it a little bit easier saying, if we choose, you know, X. If we choose this split, what the implications are going to be on uh, on that on, on that at, you know, at that split um, on the average assessed value for that for that uh, class of property. So it looks like one point three six is the most fair. Well, if I may, I didn't want to jump in, but there's an error I want to make sure everybody is called your attention to. If you look at the proposal. I just, um, I, as 
you know, I was preparing for the Portland meeting after this, so I didn't have a chance to look at this until right before the meeting. Um, if you look at the total tax for last year, right. it says 58.57. But if you look at the previous page on the bottom, it says 59.57. That, yeah, I apologize. What happened? I got involved with John in this, and uh, he didn't catch it. I just caught it when we walked in, and that's my bad. It's it's a hundred dollars off. No, I agree. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you know, my point is the increase. when you compare last year's to this year's, take a hundred dollars off the increase. It should be the average bill in FY20 is not fifty-eight fifty-seven. It's fifty-nine fifty-seven. Right. And I, I apologize. Uh, I we caught that. We had and then uh, coming in, I looked at it. And I, I had, uh, I was with John the last couple of days, and I got involved in this part of it. And I, I, I saw that at the last second. That rate, uh, for example, last year, it says 58, 50, it's off $100. So the increase would be, and I apologize again, would be $100 less on, on each scenario. So starting if, on page if, seven. If, uh, if so I could starting on page six. Page if seven. I could interject, I think it's actually correct. The incorrect information is on page four. <clears throat> Under 2020, where it has a projected rate of $16.65. That's because that number was taken from last year's classification hearing before the tax rate had been set. So the projection was 16.65. So if that was computed times the 357.830, the number would be I think uh, 5957. Yeah, but... However, the actual rate of 1637 times the 357 830 is 5857. So I think that's correct. Yeah, but then it's incorrect, then it would be, it's, it's two, different, two different numbers in two different locations. No, but I'm following what John is saying. John right. entered the meeting last year thinking the vote would be at 1665 per thousand. It actually shifted to 1637 per thousand, and therefore the rate's not, the average bill's not 5957. I'm going to assume that it's correct. actually 5857. Yeah, that that's correct. 5857? Yeah, which is what it shows on the sheet. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, all, this, all these changes are correct. So, on the sheet, all that. So, on page four? Right. Uh, this page five. I could, see, I thought, John, you could take it. Wait, just, you just pointed out to me, and so I started working on the map. No, but then, so then that means on page on uh, five. Why? Page five at the bottom, the average bill should be five, eight, five, seven, six, seven. And on the calculations and the columns, based on it being 59.57 or 58.57, the calculations in the column are correct. Yeah, correct. You're welcome. I apologize for that. Do you have any recommendation on the rate? I, uh, um, I've made it my, you know, I've been doing this a long time, and I've made it my practice really not to recommend. It's not, you know, really, you know, we set these numbers and do the values and such. And really, it's up to the local selectmen, or uh, city councils, or whoever, to adopt those rates. And, and the background on that, Denise, is when classification hearings were developed, the Department of Revenue uh, put out some guidelines and some rulings stating that the reason why this, the assessment is separated from the Board of Selectmen in the decision-making process is we assess the values of the property. So it would probably would not be good public policy for us to also be suggesting what the tax rate would be, because then would be influencing to both the value and the tax rate. So as public policy, obviously you look at um, what you think of the residential properties and the the. Um, How it's going to affect your old, the you know, yeah the yeah. condition yeah. of the taxpayers in the residential class, the condition of the taxpayers in the commercial industrial. Class and what policies you want to set in that and regard. What are we at right now? 1.4? What is our current 1.4. That was last year. It actually got carried out, I think, to 1.409 or. Yeah, it was last year. Closer to 4.1. Yeah. Anthony, where were you? 
So I, mean, I was, so if you look at 1.36, yeah. mm -hmm. that percentage wise, that would be the most fair um, increase across the three different segments. My comfort range is somewhere between 1.36 and 1.38. I think 1.38 is pretty close to the zero for an increase to the average resident. Um, and a 3% increase to commercial, a 2.5% increase to industrial. And I can identify 1.37 as my preference spot, so I'm right there with you. 1.36, 1.37, 1.38, right in that range. So I was at 1.40, keeping it the same, but I could do any of the fairness across the board. Can I say something? One thing. Um, the uh, I found some. I found something else. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So you know, with all that in perspective, if we could try to stay with no increase or as close to no increase as possible for residents, that's what I was thinking of. I'm sorry. No, all set. Thanks. Increase, correct? Oh, at 1.37, it would be a 0.83% increase, which means the average bill would increase by $49.48. But can I just ask, why do we have to increase it? Is there a reason why? Because we don't even have a budget yet, and you're going to increase. I'm not saying new people, I'm just throwing that out there. You have no facts to be looking at. The COVID is huge. 43 bucks, 50 bucks is a lot of money if you don't have it. Especially when you see a tax that's going up. And this is just another tax increase. But if we, you said we definitely need it, this is why we need it, that we understood. But there's a lot of people out there, my opinion, this is my opinion, not knowing his job, uh, what you're facing with. Because you got to answer to the choir. But I'm just saying, just for, even $5 is a lot of money. If you need the money, say the schools are going to go up, the fire department's going up and all this other stuff. And I still, all, all the years I've been coming here, 32 years going to that town meeting, I still can't figure this out. Do you want me to? <clears throat> Please. Yeah, the, um, the taxpayer here, the, the, the sometimes there's confusion about that. The fact that um, what we raised, the levy is the levy. You know, you, you, I don't know what it is, 26, 27 million. So no matter what, what you do here, or et cetera, or if we give out tax agreements, tips and stuff like that, we still raise the same amount of money. Whether you split a single rate or go to, you know, if you can now, it's 175. It shifts the burdens between classes, 
but you still rate, raise the same money. So he was alluding to, if the town needs the extra five bucks in the residential properties, they go ahead and do it. That's not the case. The case here is that the money to be raised on the uh, uh, tax generated money is the same whether you choose one split or another split. That's got nothing to do with what the town needs for money. But, uh, sorry, tax money, tax, you know, tax levy. Madam Chairman, yes. before you close the meeting, the assessors have a duty to inform the Board of Selectmen that the excess levy capacity for the current fiscal year is calculated as $2,776,515 and that the excess capacity for the prior fiscal year is calculated as $2,131,911.63. So when you certify a vote, you're, you're acknowledging that you've been informed of this excess capacity. It's a requirement to the hearing. I'll make a motion to close the hearing. All in favor? Aye. All right. At this point, we are closing the council hearing and we still need to do our regular meeting. So we're all set? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for coming in. My pleasure. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving to all. Thank you. And with that being said, I will take the motion to Motion to go into executive session.